traffic jam everywhere and all these cars produce so much greenhouse gases. Welcome to our lecture number 28 and today we talk about energy and mobility. So we would like to discuss the question how much energy do we really need for the transport of goods and people and what's the best way to do it. But before we come to the future solutions, I want to show you the status quo for the moment. So you all know transport is a key component for growth and globalization. By all this mobility, we were able to have international companies to grow together to one world in principle at least. And if we talk about growth, of course, we mean our economic growth. But as in all the environmental problems, the problem is the size. And this is the product of the number of people around and the amount of mobility and transportation each of these people wants to have. If you look at this diagram here, you see that the global energy consumption is growing all the time. And the middle dark grid area shows you the transport energy, so the energy used for transport. And this is also growing over time and it's about 30% at the moment. The diagram is somewhat old, but uh, you see the trend. So about 30% of the energy we need globally is just used for transportation. A standard way to do transportation is highways, for example. So if you look at the left picture here, there's a traffic jam and you see on the right side the transport of goods and on the left side it's standard cars, transportation of people. So both is growing immensely and of course not everything is done on the roads. A lot of the transport of the goods over continents is done by big ships. And here you see the accident which happened a few weeks ago when one of the big container ships had a problem in the Suez Channel and then it blocked the channel and it significantly impacted the world economy, especially the economy in Europe. Then we go to the mass transport of people. Also here it's not only cars, but especially in big cities you have subways and trains and you see the more people there are, the more means you need in order not to overcrowd it. If we go back in history, of course everything was renewable in the past, some one or two hundred years ago, nobody used fossil fuels. And of course, mankind used transport already since basically 200,000 years. And one of the first things to do is that they used animals, especially horses, for horse riding, for transport of as well people as also goods. But of course, horses is not the only thing, of course, Boats and ships have been built to travel over water using, for example, the wind power or the hydropower to transport the boat. And of course, later coaches were very common, especially also in our cultures. Uh, everything was transported by coaches driven by horses. But of course, all kinds of other animals have been used like camels. They even used dogs to pull wagons and to do mechanical work. And of course, oxen and donkeys and all kinds of other animals have been used depending on the area where you live. Already in the ancient days, people realized that rails are always useful for transport. One of the first areas where this was used is in mining, because if you do mining, you have to carry heavy loads out of the mine all the time. And if you have rails, the transport becomes much easier. At the beginning, these things were pushed by people, by humans. And later, of course, they also used horses or here on the picture, it's donkeys having a kind of tram on rails. And in the big picture here behind me, you see a long train of wagons in a mining area where you needed a lot of horses to pull the train, but of course you needed much less horses than if you would not have these rails. So rails make the transport much easier, of course. 
Then trams became common in a lot of towns. At the beginning, they were pushed typically by horses or donkeys. And later, of course, when there was electricity coming up, all the trams became electrical. A city which had a huge network of trams was Paris at that time. Here you see in the upper picture, you see a kind of traffic jam of four trams which are trying to cross one crossing. But also small town like our town here in Gießen had trams. Here you see four tram wagons at the Gießen marketplace. And these trams were heavily used, of course, going from the station to the center of the town down to the suburbs. Only much later, when the cars became common, then most of the trams disappeared in most of the towns. Partially it was pushed by automobile industry, because for automobile industry, trams were the showstopper, because people, of course, could travel much simpler, much cheaper with trams in big towns. So the way some companies reacted was that they bought all these tram companies and then they destroyed the trams and people were forced to use their own cars. So especially in most of the American town, people had no chance to travel without having their own car. So a similar thing happened with trains. When the steam engines were invented and the first steam locomotives were pushing trains, people realized that this is a very convenient way to travel. You could go very fast with it. It was much more comfortable than going with coaches through the roads and the forests. And of course, it was a rather cheap way and a very fast way to travel. So at that time, there have been railway companies all over the continents. And people who had enough money could travel in some kind of luxury, much better than we can do it nowadays in trains. So kings or presidents of countries had their own trains and they had their own saloon wagons, but also rich people bought sometimes their own trains. And of course, traveling was possible then in quite a luxury and depending on how much money you had, you could use a train at a high standard or you could use it on some wooden banks in a crowded group of passengers, depending on how much money you wanted to pay. So this is some of these examples. These are other examples here on what kind of luxury people had when they were traveling. So traveling at that time, of course, was not possible to do it by flights. So if you had a long distance to travel, it took typically several days. And then you, of course, enjoyed the comfort of a train ride where you had dinner and accompanying passengers, uh, which enjoyed the ride. Today, all that disappeared because the rich people don't go by train anymore. They go either by car or they go by plane. So the majority of people does not use trains anymore. Therefore, also the connections by trains are not so comfortable anymore in many countries. And this, of course, is a kind of feedback loop. The less people use it, the less useful the whole system becomes. Nowadays, as you all know, if you have a long distance transport, you take a plane usually, as well for people as for goods. But if you have a huge amount of goods, most of the transport of goods is done with big container ships like this one here. If you don't cross continents, but you drive for short or medium distances, most of the people, most of the time, use their own cars for transportation. If you want to transport goods, you typically take this kind of trucks. This is a typical European truck. In the US, they look a bit different, sometimes a bit bigger, but the principle is always the same. If you look at Germany, for example, also in Germany, about 30% of our energy is used for transport, similar as I showed you before on the global scale. And of course, all these cars go by petrol or by diesel. And actually in Germany, the amount of energy is 98.5% oil-based. So it's all oil products. A little bit could be bio-oils or bio-alcohol, but 
basically it's almost 100% fossil fuels if you look at the transport sector. This, of course, is a big problem because, as you know, we have to reduce greenhouse gases. If you use fossil fuels, you produce greenhouse gases. And if you look at our today's mobility, what do you get out of it? Well, you find out that if you look at Europe, here this is EU28, here the total amount of greenhouse gases in transport is shared among the different ways of transport that about 13% of the greenhouse gases from transport come from ships. About 13% as well come from air traffic. About 44% of the greenhouse gas shares from transport comes from cars. And the remaining 27% come from lobbies. In addition, there are a few other sources of greenhouse gases in transport, for example, motorbikes, which are almost negligible, and railways, which are about 0.5% in Europe. So this shows you that the main amount of greenhouse gases is coming from this four basic means of transport, which are used nowadays. And of course, as you all know, we have the Paris Agreement to prevent global warming. We have to reduce the greenhouse gases basically to almost zero in the next decades. And this affects, of course, all sectors. But the transport sector is especially badly affected because in the transport sector we have this uh, almost 100% fossil fuels. And therefore it has highest priority that we change the way how our transport in our modern society is working. In other words, you hear about it in politics and news everywhere. We have to go to fuel cells, we have to go to electric cars, we have to have a little bit more rail traffic. But if you look at it seriously, what do you find out? All that what we are doing here is basically 100% wrong. We have to get rid of this kind of boats, planes, cars and lorries. There's no way around it if you want to have an almost zero percent greenhouse gas emission. So there has to be a fundamental change and not a small correction, as you can imagine. So to understand better what we have to do in future, let's have a little bit of physics understanding first. Because physics understanding is something which will not change. If you talk about a certain car engine or a certain construction of a plane, those things will change every few years because there's a little bit of progress here and then. But if you talk about basic physics results, that is something which is important for all of you because what you learn here will always be valid also in 20 years or in 50 years when you are about my age. So the first question we want to ask is, do we really need energy to do transport? And the answer is, no, we don't need energy to do transport. But of course, there is a caveat behind that. So if you have a look at the sky, uh, you all know there's the International Space Station there. And if a new spaceship is arriving, it travels parallel to the space station and it travels over thousands and hundreds of thousands of kilometers around the Earth and it does not need a little bit of energy for that. So it doesn't consume any energy to do mobility, to do a movement. But of course, the life is not as simple as that. Uh, the problem here, of course, is that there is friction, especially on Earth, everything is uh, held by friction, otherwise everything would be moving in our rooms all the time. And the friction is one of the main reasons why we need energy to do transportation. So let's take the most simple example. You have a box on the floor and you want to move it. And if the box is heavy, you need a lot of power to do that. So you need a lot of force. You need a lot of energy to move it from one corner in your room to another corner. And the more heavy this box is, the more energy you need. This is quite simple to understand. Then, of course, people invented, a long time ago, they invented the wheel. And the wheel has a big advantage. You can move a wheel much easier than a square box. So the invention of the wheel helps already, but still you need energy, you need still forces and 
power to move your wheels. Actually, if you have a wheel, it is easy if you have a hard surface, but if it's a soft surface, it's hard. So if you drive with your bike through a beach on the sand, you see that the sand is very soft and it takes you a lot of energy to move your wheel, even though your bicycle has these wheels. So let's shortly do a little bit of physics so that you understand what all the components are, why you need energy to do a transport. I don't want to go into all details, but I still would like to give you a more or less complete overview of the basic formula. So in the following, let's calculate how much energy you need, so we call it W for work, to transport a certain object from one place to another place. The distance we call S, and the further the distance is, the more energy you need. This is what you are used to. This is something which you naturally know. So it's different compared to the outer space where you don't need any energy to go over long distances. Here on the ground, of course, the larger the distance is, the more energy you need. One of the biggest energy consumption in traveling is the rolling resistance of your wheels. And the rolling resistance here, called W, is proportional to a constant CRR. CRR stands for the rolling resistance constant multiplied with the mass and with the distance s. What does this formula mean? So it means that the larger your distance is, the heavier your object is, the more energy you need to transport it there. And additional to the mass and the distance, there is another constant going in, which is the rolling resistance. And the rolling resistance is a kind of material constant. The harder your ground is, the smaller this constant is. So if you have rails, like a train, you need a small amount of energy. Here's here the number 0.002. But if you have a car which has soft tires and a not so flat ground, then you have a larger constant, it's a factor of 5 larger, 0.01. And that means that if you take the same distance with the same mass on a road in your car, you need 5 times more energy than if you take a railway to do the same mass and the same distance. So this is already a first important hint. If you use rails, and these rails are hard of steel, and the wheels are hard of steel, then you have a very low rolling resistance. This is one of the biggest effects that rails have compared to normal roads. The next reason why you need energy is the air drag. So if you go by a very high speed, most of the energy you need is to get over the air drag, so all the air which is coming towards you when you are driving fast has to be pushed aside and for that you need energy. And the formula for that is that this energy is proportional to the square of the velocity times the area of your car times the distance. So what does it mean? It means if you drive twice as fast, you need four times as much energy to go over this distance. That is the reason why fast cars need a lot more petrol than if you go slowly with it. It depends on the cross section and the shape of the car or the train. This is something you can optimize. Nowadays, most of the cars are not optimized for that because these SUVs, um, they are sold by the way they look and not by the amount of energy they need for driving. Another reason to need energy for traveling is if you go uphill. You all know that if you have a bike, you go uphill, you need a lot of energy. If you go downhill, you don't need any energy to travel. The amount of energy you need is now not anymore depending on the distance you drive, but this part of the energy is just depending on the height which you take. The energy for the ascending slope is proportional to the mass times the height. So the heavier you are and the heavier your bike is, the more energy you need. And the higher the mountain is you want to go up, the more energy you need as well. The nice thing about these hills is if you go downhill, you don't need any more energy. If you have a right device, you can get back the energy which you put in by going uphill. This you call recuperation. So if you have an electric battery car, what normally is possible then is that for going up the hill, 
you need the electricity of your battery, you need a certain amount of energy, but if you go downhill, then the engine of your electric car works like a generator. It converts the potential energy and the kinetic energy of your car again back into electrical energy and stores it in the battery so that in the ideal case if you go with an electric car up and down the hill you don't need any energy in total except of course uh, the energy which you need for your rolling resistance and your air drag. So in this sense the ascending slope energy is received back after your trip if you go downhill again but of course only if you have a car which can do recuperation. What normally happens in a car is that you have to push your brakes and in the brakes then this energy is converted into heat, your brakes become hot. Or another way to do it with a normal car is that you use your engine brake and the engine brake in this case works similar to a normal brake. It also converts the potential energy by going downhill into heat and this time the heat is not happening in the brakes but in the engine which is anyway cooled. This way your brake isn't getting too hot but the energy is lost as well. So only in electrical cars and in electrical trains you are typically able to recuperate to store the potential energy if you go downhill into electrical energy again. Another thing which we should not forget is the energy which you need for accelerating your car. So if you start a car, you always need energy to bring it to a certain speed. This is the same also in space. If a rocket starts, it needs energy to get to speed. Um, and this is the same with any transport. The energy needed for that is proportional to the mass and the speed squared. So again here, the faster you are, the more energy you need at the initial state and during acceleration. But also here it's the same is true also here is if you stop your car all the kinetic energy is either lost if you have a normal car or it is recuperated if you have an electric car with recuperation. If this is possible or not depends of course on the engine and even if you have recuperation in a lot of these electrical cars, you can only use it if the deceleration is not too sudden. Because uh, if you really have to brake, if you do an emergency brake, all the motion energy comes back within a few seconds. And then this is too much power to be stored in a battery in such a short time. So these are all the different reasons why from the physics point of view you need energy if you do transportation. How much energy you need is not only depending on that but also on the efficiency of your engine. So you need of course always an engine to do transportation and then it depends on the efficiency and the type of the engine how much energy you finally need. There are huge differences. A standard combustion engine has an efficiency which is typically 30 to 40 percent if it's running with petrol. If it's running with diesel it could be a little bit higher. If you have a more modern car which, which goes with hydrogen and the fuel cells you get efficiencies up to almost 60 percent. But if you have an electric car uh, you get much higher efficiencies. You get overall efficiencies which typically are above 80 or 90 percent in principle you can go up to like something like 95 percent in a standard electrical engine. And then last not least if you can do recuperation with your car the efficiency of that is also different if you have a battery depends on the charging time of the battery how efficient you can use it. If you are connected to the grid for example the tram which is deaccelerating can push back its emotional energy directly into the grid. So there's almost no efficiency loss in that. So to get a better feeling of all these deficiencies of a standard car, I have this diagram here, which you see behind me here. So here I can show you all the effects, which are even a lot more than what I explained you in the list before. So let's go through this diagram from the left to the right. 
So imagine you put in a fuel which has 100% of energy, either petrol or diesel or electrical energy. This fuel then goes into the engine. If it's a typical car running with petrol, the efficiency is on the order of 40%. So that means that about 60% of the energy is lost in this car, in this engine already. In addition, the engine is also running when the car is not moving, for example, at the traffic light or in a traffic jam. So you have to count about 16% of standby energy, which the engine is using while it's not moving. Then you need energy for the accessoires, like your radio and your air condition and all kind of electrical stuff in your car. So that at the end, from this 100% fuel, you have 18 to 20% energy left, which goes to mechanical work in this car. This mechanical work then goes to the drivetrain, so where you have your gears, there you also lose part of the energy again. And then the rest goes onto the wheels, and the wheels then pull the car. This is the tractive energy, and this tractive energy which pulls the car then goes into the different aspects which I explained to you before. The first one is the aerodynamic drag. So about 3% is then used for this aerodynamic drag. About 3 to 4% is used for the rolling resistance of the car. And about 6% goes into what's called here the inertia. That is what I call the acceleration and deceleration energies. They normally are lost during braking process. These numbers here are taken from a car in urban driving mode, which means you drive through a big city where you have to brake all the time because the car in front of you is braking or because there's a traffic light. Of course, if you go on a highway, the numbers look different. You would have, of course, less standby energy. You would have less inertia and braking energy but you would probably go a lot faster so that, so that you would have a lot larger aerodynamic drag. So you see, if you are driving a car, it's basically 100% inefficient. If we think about that, we in principle don't need any energy at all to do transport. And a car with a combustion engine is, is an example of an especially bad design from the point of energy. Of course, I don't want to say that uh, the engineers haven't done a good job. If they change the efficiency of a car by 3 or 1%, it's already a big deal for them. But the problem, of course, is that they are limited by something which they cannot change. You can only change it if you change the system as a whole. So if you go, for example, to an electric car. So now we are almost at the end. So next time I would like to explain you how, from my point of view, uh, future sustainable transport should look like. And it's clear from what we have learned today what the main aspects of this is. So if you want to have an energy efficient transport, you probably want to go on rails wherever possible. Your trains should not be too heavy, they should not be too fast, they should be limited in cross-section or optimized in shape, which actually means that you don't want to reduce the cross-section, but you want to increase the length of the train, maybe. Then you should have electric engines. You should use overhead lines so that you don't have inefficiencies in batteries, for example. You should be able to recuperate your energy in a grid. and of course, another thing we should not forget, if you do a lot of traveling nowadays, uh, you find that a lot of the trains are half empty or are almost 90% empty. So to have an efficient transport, of course, you need more or less full trains. It does not help if you have a highly efficient train and you send it around all day and there's no people and no goods inside. So there it goes beyond physics, of course, to define a system which is overall efficient and useful for the people and for transporting goods. And if you do that, I will show you next time that it's quite easy 
to save a factor of 10 in energy consumption if you do the right concepts of mobility and of transport. So thank you for listening and for watching this video. I hope you learned something and I'm looking forward for the next lecture where I show you my vision of the future of transport. Maybe it's an utopia and maybe you don't agree to that, but still I would like to show it to you next time. Thank you and have a good time. Bye. Thank you.